I was recently going through some old videos, and realized that my approach to reviewing Rayman's Game Boy Advance games in the past was rather negative. I've since gone through a spirit journey to find out if they're actually as disappointing as I once thought. As a bonus, at the end I'll be taking a look at the Game Boy Color games. Can't think of a better opportunity. Let's start with Rayman 3. Stay with me here, because explaining how this game fits in with the rest of the series will be complicated no matter how I go about it. So last time, in Rayman 2, our hero defeated the Robo-Pirate threat. Their leader, Admiral Razorbeard, manages to escape at the last moment. From here, the full-blown sequel Rayman 3 Hoodlum Havoc begins. It starts with the Red Lums, which are energy spheres that, when frightened, turn into Dark Lums. When the first Dark Lum, Andre, was born, he created a new threat in the Glade of Dreams, the Hoodlum Army. Unfortunately for him, he's accidentally swallowed by Globox in the first act. This makes Globox behave a little funny, so the two spend most of the game trying to extract him. Once he's out, he finds another enemy of Rayman, Reflux. They team up to take Rayman down, but this fails and Rayman ends up victorious. The Dark Lums restore to Red Lums, however, what frightened them in the first place is still around. So the Dark Lum problem is still at large. This seems to be where Rayman 3 on the Game Boy Advance kicks in. Remember Admiral Razorbeard? Well, he's back. This character played no part in Hoodlum Havoc, so it's already a wildly different story from the console Rayman 3. What's been long speculated is that Rayman 3 is actually a port of Rayman 2 that was changed up late in development, in which case it's probably not canon. You'll be visiting the same locations, completing the same objectives, meeting the same characters, and fighting the same bosses all from Rayman 2. The only reason that this could ever be called Rayman 3 is because of its cutscenes, and a couple stages where the hoodlums are thrown in haphazardly. So here's how the story goes down this time. Globox accidentally swallowed a Dark Lum. Again. It's never addressed as the second time, but there's no mention of Andre. And yet the hoodlums exist, which were invented by Andre, the first Dark Lum. So by order of events, this has to take place after Hoodlum Havoc. The Dark Lum inside Globox causes him to act a little funny. Again, so he takes off. But this time, Rayman will spend the duration of the game looking for him. Since Rayman 2, Admiral Razorbeard has spent his time away rebuilding the Robo-Pirate army. His minions are now on the hunt for Globox. Razorbeard plans to extract the Dark Lum from him and use its great powers to become Head Honcho once more. Wait, Dark Lums have great powers? Since when? The only power they had were those laser washing powders. Those were invented by them, so... I guess he values their intelligence? Well, anyways, there's plenty of Dark Lums hanging around the game's third world, so why bother extracting it from Globox? They're quite weak on their own, just get one yourself. I think this dude's gone nuts. And bolts. That beating in Rayman 2 must have done a number on him. Whatever the case, very little is done to make actual sense of this plot within the game's universe. Rayman begins his journey in the forests, where the player encounters fairly basic but enjoyable level design. There are multiple paths, with usually one linear path that leads you to the next. Other paths contain goodies like lums and cages, along with the occasional robo-pirate battle. When it comes to the actual combat, it's a matter of spamming your fist forward whenever their iframes are gone, which is not particularly fun. I much prefer the vine climbing, lum swinging, and ground pounding. <laughs> I like the animation where Rayman tosses his body below him while doing a little flip. True Smash roster potential. The first world is enjoyable as you learn how everything works. It's easy and linear with a pretty environment and tight controls. Wacky story aside, maybe this won't be so bad. Rayman thinks that perhaps Globox has gone to the swamps because Dark Lums love warm, damp areas. And there's the excuse for riding Sam the Snake again from Rayman 2. All he wanted was a visit and what do we give him? A non-canonical rehash. Poor lad. I like how Rayman bobs perfectly to the music. Towards the end of the first world, you come across the level Hoodlum Hideout. Many Hoodlum types are represented in the game, but for some reason most of them look like the Grim Keepers. Now, when you think of Hoodlums, the Hoodmonger probably comes to mind. And yet there's not a single one in the game. Unless you count the box art. Globox has been spotted in the Land of Bad Dreams which is basically Rayman 2's Cave of Bad Dreams. But before the scary stuff, you'll enter a level that requires you flick four switches to exit, which is remarkably similar to Rayman 2's Echoing Caves introduction. Next, Kart Racing in Hell. 
It's pretty slippery, which can be a bit of fun for that reason, but you may find yourself sliding into lava rather often. While the second world starts off okay, the moment you enter the bad dreams, well, self-explanatory that one, it's a nosedive in quality. You'll encounter the first instance of an ongoing issue, where new mechanics are introduced, then prioritized for a short while, but afterwards they're barely used. That's unfortunate, yet forgivable. What isn't is when they seem to give up on the level design and copy-paste the same mechanic sequences over and over. Void of Bones is the best example of this. In the same world, you'll ride Sam the Snake again in a level called Swamp of Begoniax 2. So, a swamp from the forests is also in the land of bad dreams? Next, you'll visit Magma Cosm, which is basically the sanctuary of stone and fire. This world is a big improvement over the last where I actively wanted to stop playing the game. It's more reminiscent of the first world where they're using Rayman's abilities properly. While they do use the plum riding mechanic very often, there are plenty of fun ideas with its use, such as having to crouch or punch a bomb in the way. It's a lot more variety than climbing bones for the 15th time. This world also has a stage where Rayman can fly upwards temporarily after picking up a blue lum. Blue lum? But in Hoodlum Havoc, the flight power was yellow. Well, Hoodlum Havoc didn't have yellow lums. But this does because I suppose the Robo-Pirates have shattered the heart of the world? Again? In the final chapter, Rayman makes his way to the pirate stronghold where Globox has been captured. He escapes from some spiders, fights the scrapped scale man boss from Hoodlum Havoc, then encounters the Grolgoth, which was destroyed in Rayman 2, but now it's back. Once that's taken care of, Globox vomits out the Dark Lum like nothing ever happened, and the day is saved. And that's the end. Hmm. I can say I feel more positively about this game today than I did back when. It has its moments, and a few ideas that, if fleshed out more, could have made for a decent 2D platformer. At best, it's a serviceable time waster, but at worst, it's an exercise in frustration. Before we get to the next game, I'd like to touch on the bonus features. The earlier Rayman Advance, which is more or less a port of Rayman 1 with technical limitations, was meant to have a multiplayer mode, but unfortunately this was cancelled. Although, it seems to have inspired the modes available in Rayman 3. If you have multiple carts and link cables, you can play with up to four people. That'd take a committed group of Rayman fans. Knowing that we're few and far between, I wonder how often this was actually achieved. If you connect your Game Boy Advance to Rayman 3 on the GameCube, you'll unlock 10 rather difficult bonus levels. So if you're desperate for more, you'll have to buy a GameCube, copy of the console game, and a link cable. Honestly didn't expect to use this thing again, yet here we are. Might as well also mention that, separate from the Game Boy Advance game, you can connect your GBA to a GameCube running Rayman 3 to play a pretty cool minigame called Mad Tracks. One player drives Rayman's shoe, and the other will use the Game Boy Advance to place tracks down for the player to drive on. Neat! I really like this! So that's been Rayman 3 on the Game Boy Advance. Now, let's move on to the true Hoodlum Havoc sequel, Hoodlum's Revenge. You know, even with this one, I can't say for sure whether it's part of the official canon or not. Nonetheless, as mentioned earlier, in the real Rayman 3, the Dark Lum Lord Andre was successfully removed from Globox. The game ends with Rayman having defeated him and his companion Reflux, although the Dark Lums still pose a threat to the Glade of Dreams. Rayman and Globox are unaware of this, and have decided to take a nap in the forest. Suddenly, Globox is awoken by a strange sound. Moments later, Rayman also wakes up, only to find that his friend has disappeared. Where'd Globox end up this time? Turns out he's been captured by the remaining Hoodlum army. But wait, Rayman defeated Andre and Reflux, so who's in charge this time? Well, despite Andre leaving Globox's stomach long ago, it's later revealed that he left a piece of his spirit inside of him. Now the Hoodlums have created a new plan to clone Reflux using the power of Plum Juice. But it gets worse. They're using Globox as a host body. Rayman will have to defeat the Hoodlums once more, and figure out how to get Andre's spirit out from Globox. Yep, this is a weird one. Once you start the game, the shift in perspective is immediately apparent. This is the only Rayman game to date that plays in an isometric view, using 3D models converted into 2D sprites. It appears quite similar to Spyro's games on the platform, and this is no coincidence. Two programmers who worked on Spyro's Dragon Engine assisted in developing the Hoodlum's Revenge Engine called Melk. Shout out to Drooly and Raycarrot for discovering this recently. Now, the best way I can explain this game is that it's like a series of mazes. You can often see the exit door early into a level, 
but how you'll unlock it is the question. The player will need to make use of switches, laser washing powder, and the occasional assistance from Globox to proceed. Indeed, Globox is a playable character in this game. He's a bit slower and can't jump, but has the unique ability of being able to drink plum juice barrels that give him extra power. Globox can then destroy a hoodlum in this state with one punch. However, without it, he'll scurry away from the enemies, as Globox is a Freddy Cat. Uh, frog. When the plum juice is active, the player will also be rewarded with extra combo points. Oh yeah, you know that system from Hoodlum Havoc? It makes a return here. Some of the best levels in this game are when you're able to switch between Rayman and Globox by using the select button. The two can help each other almost cookies and cream style. Don't know if you've ever played that PS2 game? It was made by From Software. Yeah, the Dark Souls guys, imagine that! I must say, the worlds of Hoodlum's Revenge look great. Rayman games have always had talent in their art direction, even when it's lacking in certain consistencies. For example, the heavy metal fist in Hoodlum Havoc? Yeah, now it's yellow, and it turns Rayman purple. The throttle copter? It's blue! In the other GBA games, the helicopter icon was blue, but this one's in a canister. Anything to separate from the lums, I guess. Speaking of, did the yellow lums scatter again? The heart of the world needs better security, and fast. Keeping with the Rayman 2 themes, the light motif strikes again throughout a good portion of this soundtrack. As far as I could tell, no Rayman 3 themes are being represented here. That's a shame. There is a lot to scratch your head at here. The game does have a reputation for being kinda weird, however underneath the surface is some fairly enjoyable level design. Most levels in the game are very distinct with unique ideas. Sometimes Rayman needs to take a raft between areas, and there's one level where you're in the clouds and need to find power-ups to traverse from one area to another. I also think it's pretty neat how they've made use of several uncommon enemies from Hoodlum Havoc, like the Potocroc and Ninja Crabs. I can't forget the new power-up for fire resistance that lets you temporarily walk on lava. How about that escort mission with Globox? His levels are paced much differently, which adds further variety to the game. Yeah, I'd say there's a lot of good stuff here. Like the ridiculous dialogue you get after freeing a caged teensy. This has a greater presence with Rayman fans today as a meme than the actual game itself. Being the case with a lot of potentially good games, there's a lack of quality control that holds it back substantially. Let me explain what I mean. Vertical space is difficult to determine in an isometric perspective, so oftentimes I'd fly to one area thinking it was safe, when it wasn't. Since Rayman's helicopter hair ends without warning, I could easily fall into the water without any nearby platforms to reach for. Touching the water consecutively three times will kill the player, with the second hit doing an absurd amount of damage. I understand the need to keep players inbound to prevent exploits, but as a result of this, I frequently want to give up on the game. Aiming and shooting your fists is extremely awkward, to the point that it barely works. With the amount of combat in this game, that's a huge problem. Oftentimes, the player can't see the intended path because the camera doesn't reach far enough. You have to use the L button and D-pad to look further, and that does work fine. But in designing these landscapes, they certainly could have paid more attention to the limited camera space. Another annoyance is when Globox scurries off after spotting a hoodlum. Usually, getting back on track is easy, but unfortunately, in several tight areas with hoodlums around, Globox can get temporarily stuck. If the game just kept me outside their boundary and gave me full control of that sprinting fool, then this would have been fine. But otherwise, it's just frustrating. Extra time for certain power-ups would have also been nice. For example, there's one mission where you'll switch between Rayman and Globox, and you'll have to destroy a door with the heavy metal fist. It's required that you switch to Globox to swap a current so that Rayman can direct the raft to get to the door. You have barely enough time to hit it once, and you have to do it three times. The huge hitbox of the raft made it very difficult to get off the thing in the first place, let alone with enough time to hit the door. I was never more frustrated with the game than this moment. Well, the last thing I have written here is that boss music reuses tracks from older levels. The final one is hilarious in context, sounding joy-free as if your friend didn't just mutilate into a guy you've already killed. I don't want to end the game on a bad note because it's not deserving of that. Hoodlum's Revenge is fairly creative, and I've grown somewhat of a fondness for it. The majority of its problems are technical, which is such a shame because I really doubt this will ever get remastered. I believe it's worth a try, 
so long as what I've said hasn't completely turned you off to it. Rayman Raving Rabbids. In case you're unaware, this is nothing like the console game. Again, you ask? Well, this is actually the one time where it makes sense. You see, Rayman Raving Rabbids went through troubled development. Initially, there was a Rayman 4 project by Phoenix Studios, and it got cancelled. Perhaps GBA Rabbids started development as a port of that game, since it uses many familiar elements from it. Then, the internal team at Ubisoft begins working on a different Rayman 4, where Rayman would confront an overwhelming mass of bunnies gone bad. Wait, no, it's too ambitious! Now Rayman will be... imprisoned by them to play minigames? The imprisonment is pretty much the only consistent thing between the final and GBA game. The developers at Visual Impact Productions were probably fed up with all the changes, and managed to stick with the second plan instead. So the story goes, after so many years of torment from other species, the rabbits have gone berserk and plan to take it out on everyone. Now, Rayman has to escape their prison. Murphy and Lee the Fairy, who I'm guessing is only here because they needed a fairy and her sprites existed, assist him along the way with tips and new powers to navigate the land. All the while, you'll come across a strange variety of creatures, many of which will be encountered three times or less. These are Rayman's outfits. You'll collect them throughout the game to use in short problem-solving situations. Gangsta lets you ground pound. Gothic lets you spit bubblegum. Hello, Phoenix Studios. Granny lets you bypass security cameras and throw carrots. The carrot mechanic is only used on a boss, so you might end up forgetting about it. This scrapped enemy seemed to make use of it at some point, which probably would have made for its introduction. Rock and Roll lets you open certain paths or take down specific enemies. And Disco lets you throw a super powerful attack. Speaking of that last one, there's a bug towards the end of the game where destroying a specific robot corrupts the graphics. This isn't the case in the updated PAL cartridge, which is what I've used for this playthrough. I've made note of several differences, one example being new animations for some enemies. This release of the game has been improved, but it's still rather buggy. Whether it be animations playing incorrectly, or that ice cream topper I broke moments ago falling through the screen again, at least this time, nothing affects the actual gameplay. Speaking of, the player should feel right at home here. This game is in the same style as Rayman 3 on the GBA, but with new graphics and a huge improvement in level design. They are much larger, and while subjective on this front, I find the environments are far more interesting. Ironically, the premise of these worlds is very simplistic. You'll visit what's essentially a massive playground, a world of cakes. One of them is completely organic, resembling the insides of a giant monster. The whole game is like a series of weird childhood dreams and nightmares, which is quite on brand for the twisted fantasy world of Rayman. While your goal is still to follow a linear path to complete levels, there's a good variety of areas to explore. An alternate path is visible at just about every point of the game. Exploration is required, as you won't be able to fight the end-of-world boss without first breaking open a certain number of cages. The first boss fight is a given, however, where Rayman fights against a giant toy Ting commanded by a pink rabbit. Boss fights are quite easy. It's not often a case of them taking hits, rather using your unique abilities and the environment to take your enemy down. Like Rayman 3 on GBA, there are also racing sequences for no explicit reason. The movement of this ship is far easier to adjust to than the wobbly physics of that cart. There are also less hazards, so if I lose here, it's more likely my own fault. First try, that was close. At least once per world, the game puts Rayman in a timed level that's cluttered with lums. Wait, you mean to tell me that the lums scattered again? <sighs> they ought to pass this responsibility to someone else, man. The teensies are in way over their heads. A shout-out is deserved for the soundtrack, which isn't forcing the Rayman 2 leitmotif in every other track. That's refreshing. Most of it's quite good as well. You might have noticed my lack of mentioning the Rabbids. Despite being the focus of this game, their presence is about as common as any other foe until you've reached the last world. And that's a shame, especially since combat is handled much better here than on Rayman 3 on GBA. I am rather content that it doesn't break the pacing anymore, as most enemies take no more than two hits to be knocked down. No iframes. For a game of a style like this, it's greatly preferred. One thing I really liked was how you start the game in their prison, only to escape, then return at the end of the game with all your powers. It's the ultimate payback for what they've done to the Glade of Dreams. The ending, however, is awfully anticlimactic. Rayman defeats a rabid ship, and Lee congratulates him. Then you get this goofy screen, and the game resets. 
Rabbids on GBA was certainly rushed together. It probably would have been a little better if the Rayman 4 situation had gone as intended. But the mishmash that this game is doesn't make for a bad time. I'd recommend it if you're looking for something goofy to play. But what about Rayman's Game Boy Color games? We'll start with Rayman 1. Wow, look at the compressed Rayman 2 promo clips they snuck into this thing. I remember being amazed when I first saw this. Story's the same as the original. Mr. Dark stole the Great Protoon and the Electoons have scattered. Now Rayman has to save the day. Famously on Game Boy Color, this version of the game was also available for PDAs and Pocket PC, featuring various improvements such as enhanced graphics and a world map that you can access without using a password. Oh yeah, the game uses passwords, so keep a pen and paper handy, unless you plan to beat it in one go. This was the first Rayman game to reuse Rayman 2's soundtrack. Ironically, it makes the least sense of the bunch. There's no real connection to Rayman 2 here besides it being the sequel. Oh well, what matters the most is gameplay, which is distinctly Rayman with most of the same notes as before. You've got living stones, swinging plums, captured friends, and secret platforms coming from nowhere. There's also its own equivalent to the timed magician challenges, and those levels where you have to outrun a flood. Even Dark Rayman is here, following your every move in one later stage. Preceding this is a level where the left and right mappings are swapped, so you have to press the opposite to go in the correct direction. Trippy. And who could forget the epic final battle with Mr. Dark without having to break every cage first? Credit to the art team, this looks great for a Game Boy Color game. Every inch of the world is considerably detailed. Animations are quite good as well, with its many creatures that are full of life and feel true to a cartoon, like the original Rayman was. I like how he waves at the camera when you enter a level. This initiates the first time that the player stands still, so you can actually have him do this towards the end of a stage so long as you're always moving. Frankly, I made a habit of doing this myself. While capturing much of the original's essence, GBC Rayman also adds a couple unique forestry worlds. Within these, you'll find some new mechanics like a three-way horn that can blow Rayman to great heights. Players are likely to stumble across this Yubi key. At the time, certain Game Boy Color games by Ubisoft had one. Now, I've never done this, but apparently if you come across a friend with their own Game Boy Color and Ubisoft game, they could send or receive a key using the infrared sensor. This would unlock bonus content. In Rayman's case, a short, enemyless time attack level called Yubi Cliff. Don't you miss when games had stuff like this? Which you could access for free? I really like Rayman 1 on the Game Boy Color. It's got it where it counts. I just wish it was using the correct music from Rayman 1. Too bad there's none of that in the next game either. Although suitingly so, because this is actually Rayman 2. What do you know, it's a portable rendition of the console game which it represents. Why was this such a rarity for Rayman? I love that they've included distinct references to the console game, such as this one instance where you're to travel a short distance on what's assumed to be Sam the Snake. Most of the original score is here too, although reused from the last game and completely out of order. If you thought the first Game Boy Color game was technically impressive, you can expect the same from this one. Although, as is the style of Rayman 2, its atmosphere is much darker. It starts off similarly to Rayman 1 GBC, though quickly shifts into constant shades of brown and dark blue, it feels... depressing in comparison. Rayman 1 on GBC had some great digital art that would show between levels, which are still here in Rayman 2, but not as great. In fact, a lot of it looks rather silly. This release stayed on Game Boy Color. No variants were made from it. Perhaps they felt that this time they weren't as important. Now, which of the two games has the better gameplay is a bit subjective. Rayman 1 GBC was very linear. You always had a clear idea of where to go, Rayman 2 GBC doesn't follow this format often, frequently deviating from it with the use of switches. Earlier in the game, I found the puzzles to be simple, but fun. Although the more it happened, the game began to feel repetitive. At one point, I began damage boosting past barriers to get certain annoying sections over with. It's a somewhat longer game than the first. I clocked my playthrough at an hour and 50 minutes, whereas the last one was an hour and 30. Granted, I did have to restart levels more often in this one. There are significantly more hazards, and while you do get all your existing powers from the start of the game, it's still rather difficult at times. I found myself taking many leaps of faith when it required me to move lower on the screen. Not a good idea to get the player used to this, else they'll start taking greater risks in preparation for what might not be there. Good thing it includes a save game battery. They give you three save slots, so your siblings can play without affecting your progress. This game's considered pretty rare these days, 
It was released towards the end of the Game Boy Color's mainstream appeal, so they probably didn't make too many of these. Copies outside of North America are a bit easier to find on sites like eBay, but for some reason that one's called Rayman 2... forever? I've never had the boxes for these games, so I've just realized that all three releases use the same cover with a different colored background. Wow. Despite there being plenty of pirate imagery in the game, you'll fight just two robo-pirates, and they count as boss fights. One's a generic Henchman 800, the other is... a generic Henchman 800. Except we're led to believe it's Razorbeard? I find it strange that the generic boss is fought on a pirate ship, but the final boss is fought on some isolated field. Did they confuse the two? Ultimately, when compared with the last game, it feels like an expansion pack with aesthetic changes and added depth which it arguably didn't need. I keep looking at this footage thinking, come on frame, find the redeeming qualities! But I just don't find it very fun. There's something about the charm of Rayman 1 that made this limited Game Boy Color format acceptable, but for Rayman 2, I don't feel like it translates very well here. Perhaps I'm in the minority with this one. What do you guys think? Alright, it's about time to wrap things up. If you're looking to play these games, sadly, at the time of posting, your choices are only cartridges or emulation. Rayman Advance and Rayman 3 were once available on the Wii U eShop, but that storefront has since been shut down. There are more portable Rayman games from around the time which I haven't talked about today, those being the simple Java games that you could play on your 2000s model phones. If you're curious, check out the older video where I briefly looked at each one. So, what's your favorite of the games shown off today? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to hear more from me in the future, consider subscribing to the channel. See you next time!